Okay, so we're back and you were talking about your parents. <laughs> yeah, so it might sound like three hours or four hours a day. It's very little time. But um, what you have to take in consideration is that um, people in the kibbutz started their work day around 6 a.m. or so. And usually by two, um, everybody will be done with the day. The, the grown grownups uh, would go home, take a nap, um, take a shower, and those of them who were parents. So by the time it was four p.m., they they already came home, rested. And they didn't have to worry about paying the bills and how to, you know, they, they didn't have all the, like, um, a lot of the worries that people in the cities have. If you're a parent or whoever of you who's watching it is a parent, or in general, a, a grown-up here in the U.S., think about when you're getting home, 5, 6 p.m., and then you have to worry about so many things. You have to cook. There are bills to pay. Um, the car broke, and you need to take it to, to the uh, shop. A million things. Um, yes. You never, your your mind is thinking about so many things, so yes, you come home and your children are already there and they're going to be there until they go to school at eight or seven or eight in the morning. But your brain, your mind is not really there most of the time. And the hours we spent with our parents were, could have been fully dedicated to us. Um, so I don't even know that many parents here would have full three hours a day that are family time and kids time so in that way uninterrupted time which i think is interesting it's it's uninterrupted right. by having to make dinner for example or uh, all of i the... mean there there was very all the um kind of a word escapes my mind but all, all the little all the everyday worries like about survival <laughs> they didn't have it um so on one hand it's a much more focused and concentrated 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 ah concentrated time Con yeah with your children which is nice uh, i mean we we took our showers and most of us did homework at the children house so our parents didn't even have to take care of, of that. Uh, and I mean, if we were sick, our caregiver would take us to the doctor. So, yeah, um, when that's you had nice. When time with your parents, how did you spend it? Did you read books, play games, go so, for walks? Yeah, that's, um, that's what we did. Read books, um, played games. Uh, play with my brothers. Uh, I have four brothers, uh, but the age gap is so that uh, we there were never um, basically. Uh, when I have a twin brother, and our older brother is two years uh, older than us, so yeah, um, we would spend time together beat each other up <laughs> but also we would go out and play with other children you know because we could run outside completely unsupervised because it was so safe it was physically safe and um mostly uh, uh safe from bad bad things um how many brothers do you have all together? I have four brothers. And you're the only now, girl in the family? Yeah. Wow. So 
one thing though about this thing of, of meeting your parents for three, four hours a day, that's very, you know, focused on, on that. On one hand, it's good. On the other hand, it's very artificial because mm-hmm. you never get to see your parents being human. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, you don't see your parents cry. I mean, I, I think maybe when I was uh, seven or eight or nine, maybe it was the first time I saw my mother ever, ever saw my mother cry. And it was like a really shocking event. Uh, like we didn't know that grown ups cry. Now, I guess not everybody are like me, but my son who grew up uh, in, uh, uh, you know, grew up with me and my husband at the same house, uh, saw me cry many times. And, and, and when he was very young, it's like, you know, I like, I, I had like, if I, I had a um, bad mood or something and um, let's, I'll say shortly, just because it's not completely relevant, somewhat relevant. I <clears throat> I also have um, bipolar disorder, which wasn't diagnosed until I was 43 years old, which is less than 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> so at certain times I was like depressed. So my son, and I can't say if it's good or bad, but he did get to see you know, his mother being in a, you know, depressed mood or his mother cry. Um, and um, things like that. So we, <clears throat> we didn't, uh, a lot of things, you know, that children who live in the same house with their parents are more aware of their parents being, <clears throat> excuse me, a whole person, okay? Um, and so I think kind of for our time frame that may be enough unless you want to ask a follow-up question about that. I did have a follow-up question about um, playing outside and how you described it as this rural environment, very safe. What kind of games would you play outside with your brothers or with the other children? Some of these games, I don't actually know how to call them in English, but we would play tag. We would play hide and seek. We would play cowboys and Indians. And yes, in 1970 in Israel, it was not Native Americans. (laughs) Or or um, <laughs> um, my brother really loved like pretending he's like a soldier and play these type of games. Um, but yeah, we were like, and, and play with the marbles and capture the flag. Um, these were, that was fun, you know, playing with the other kids and, you mentioned yeah. that there was no television there for a while. Did you eventually have a television? So <clears throat> when we were very little, first of all, in Israel, there was only one TV channel. It was one government controlled TV channel, black and white. Um, so I think probably when I was around four there was one TV in a central location, kind of like a clubhouse. And um, sometimes my mom would take us there and we sit and with other people and watch TV. Um, but it was one government controlled channel. Um, so basically children programming was only between like 3 p.m. to like 6 p.m. Um, there wasn't a choice of programs. So, you know, it, it, TV and we loved it, but it wasn't a big thing. 
later on, I don't remember exactly how old I was, probably less than 10. We got a TV. And when I say we got a TV, remember I said there was no private property in the kibbutz. Everything like, like a TV, also the members didn't have money. Okay. So the way you would get things in the kibbutz is that by, by order of seniority, like how many years you've been in the kibbutz, the kibbutz will distribute things that the kibbutz assembly decided that, that the kibbutz would provide. So like, I don't know, let's let's say in like 1975, the kibbutz assembly decided that members would get TVs, but then there is a limited budget and like, okay, but we have budget only for buying like uh, uh, 30 TVs a year and they're like 200 households. So, you know, maybe by 77, my parents got their TV from the kibbutz. In 1986, a very important thing happened, and it was that we got a color TV. <laughs> a big <laughs> event, no doubt. Oh, yes. Um, so tell me a little bit about your education growing okay. up. So <clears throat> as I mentioned many times, we all grew up in one house with our peers from the same age group. Um, my the age group of 1971 was eight children, four boys, four girls. Um, so education starts, it's it's the whole time basically you you're when you're in the children's house. So in in preschool, well, basically, uh, most of it was through like you know play and and the 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 educator and caregiver they would read to us and we would listen to records. Um, we had we had nap every day, and they would play a record like as at the time we were going to sleep, and <laughs> when we were young, it was like records with stories. Uh, or but sometimes they put classical music and we all hated it. <laughs> We're like, hey, no, we want you know Peter and the Wolf and uh, you know. <clears throat> Anyways, um, starting kindergarten was more a little bit more formal. <clears throat> the woman who was our basically my preschool teacher from the time I was like three years old. She was also our homeroom teacher uh, until I was in second grade. Um, so when you start your more formal education, yeah, you go to the classroom and they teach you whatever they teach you. But the kibbutz definitely had a different educational system uh, than, than the cities. Um, we had uh, had much more opportunities for like what they called it like experiential uh, uh, learning. So, uh, like when we learned about birds, we would go outside with the teachers and walk around the community and see birds and collect feathers and things like that. Um, now I. Now I know I always had some learning differences. Um, but I'm also in today's in today's terms in Montgomery County, it would be called GTLD. Are you familiar with GTLD? No, what's or that? Twi for? Twice twice exceptional. Oh, interesting. Gif gifted and talented, oh, learning I disabled. I see. Okay. Now, let's start with, there were eight children in my class. It might sound great to y'all that have 30 children in the class, but it's a problem because... You really have to 
you can't like divide kids into groups of like, okay, those who are more advanced in something would study with those. So you have eight children. One or two are kind of like below average. One or two are above average and a few more in the middle. But finally, because it's such a small group, there is actually less space for personalized curriculum. Um, because personalized would really literally mean each person gets their own. And so I was in some things in the above average group, which meant I, I understood what they say very quickly. But the cold classroom would always have to go by the slowest person. Um, and that's very frustrating. It's very frustrating for the slowest person too, because they know that everybody is like, you know, waiting for them. And I was very, very bored. On the other hand, <clears throat> my my difficulties, I mean, I was writing very slowly, um, but it really, it wasn't like a physiological issue. It's like, I think very fast, but for me to kind of have a physical out, output um, to like, I could very easily uh, verbally tell you what I I learned and and do a good job of it. But if I had to write it, I I had a problem with it. So, and also, I have the issue that like if I not if I don't understand something one hundred percent, I kind of get stuck. And this is basically ADHD. I mean that's one of the what one of the things. So when we were doing homework and we're doing it on our on our own, just to do it by myself was very hard to to put it into writing and whatever. And in class, I was very good. So I was like, okay, I basically I wasn't doing my homework. Um, and I was getting like, like scolded for it. But on the other hand, nothing else was done because I was doing so well in class. Okay. Um, but I always felt like, like inadequate because um, I wanted to do what I needed to do. I, you know, I wanted to be a good girl. Um, so, and also in, in math, I, well, still, I still had, I want to say good grades, but there was no thing, such thing as grades in the kibbutz school. That's different than the cities in, in the cities in Israel had the regular normal system, like, you know, up, uh, other places, um, we didn't exactly have tests. We didn't exactly have grades, but um, it's a very complicated topic. Um, it is a huge topic. One thing that I'd love to know about is when you first started studying English, you're going to be an English major. You've written poetry that's been published. You obviously <laughs> have a love for the language. Can you talk a little bit about that, about your love for poetry? Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, when you say started learning English, you like, okay, when, when you say English in the US, uh, we call it literature in, in our, like in, in Israel, when we say Eng like you study English, it means English language. English is a second language, which by the way, we started at fourth grade. Now they start at three, third grade. And it goes all the way through high school um, because there isn't like 
you can't learn a uh, language uh, in school by having like one semester like they have here in high schools and a year later, another semester. So we started learning English as a second language, fourth grade. Um, are you asking about my love of English as, as a academic subject in, in a U.S. university? That is such a great question. Because I speak English to non-native speakers. So initially, I was very interested in your interests in English and how you learned English as a second language. And oh, yeah. I'm also interested in the follow-up question, which is your love for literature and for poetry. Yeah. So you can so answer English that as a you second want. language. Um, this is, it's very interesting. As I said, we studied from fourth grade and up through the end of high school. Um, usually it was like twice a week because we didn't have a system like here where you learn the same subject every day. Uh, we had each subject a few times a week. Therefore, we were many, we were able to learn eight or nine subjects uh, uh, a, a week and not like four like they do here in high school, which I completely don't get. Um, anyways, and the results are actually less good than if you do it like the system we had. The interesting thing is that there are kids that were in my class that studied the same number of years of English. Some of us speak excellent English and some of, some of them finished high school without being able to carry a daily conversation. So it's very different between each person. Another thing is about English as second language, and it's actually one of your written questions, which I think it's a really good one. TV in Israel, um, those children programs we watch that were available like two hours a day, um, all the all the like drama series was American uh, American uh, uh, shows. Um, I grew up watching Little House in the Prairie. I remember that. And one uh, uh, fi fire station uh, show. Um, uh, I, I, again, it was in the 70s, so it's not Chicago Fire, okay? Uh, but uh, it was in English. And in Israel, unlike in many other countries, the... the um, non-Hebrew speaking shows were not like dubbed or synchronized. There was no voiceover. It was in English with subtitles. And actually, this is a very good way to, to learn a language. Um, from, if, if, the, if it's synchronized with the voiceover, you learn nothing because you hear your own language. But you watch TV for many years and it's in English with subtitles, you actually learn a lot. And also it helps with the, um, the accent. Um, and again, that's me and my brother and a bunch of other kids. It's not everybody. Um, Do you think your interest in the United States was sparked by watching some of these television shows? No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I, 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 you know, actually that, that would, I, I, I want to speak a little more about the education thing and then we, it actually a good transition to the okay. U.S. immigrant things. Um, <clears throat> anyways, I, my 12 years of school were uh, in, of intense uh, suffering. <laughs> um, Sorry. Growing up in the small kibbutz in Israel, there were no, there were no such things as as programs for uh, gifted children <clears throat> uh, and help for people with learning disabilities. You have had to be, you have had to be in very like have something very significant to be considered uh, like the children in my class that got help for learning disabilities were really slow, okay? It was like 
you could see and and they were having a hard problem with uh, problems with comprehension and things like that i didn't get any additional stimulation as a gifted person and definitely nobody could have imagined back then that you can be gifted and challenged at the same time, like um, learning disabled at the same time. So I was deathly bored. I mean, cause everything they spoke of in class, I would get the first time and maybe some other kids needed the second time but we would have to sit there and listen to also the fourth and fifth time for that last, you know, straggler. And until they did that guy a huge favor that really, uh, and sent him to a, a school that was more suitable for him. Um, and I mean, I feel, I feel like, bad for what he had to go through by the fact and it wasn't out of bad intentions like the thing is that he needed a special education school but think about you couldn't have a special education school in a place where first to sixth grade you have 70 students that's the whole you know had eight kids so the, the special ed school was somewhere where he had to be bused like 45 minutes a day. But his life got much better once he got what he needed. Now, I never got what I needed. So I didn't have the extra stimulation that I needed as a, as a gifted person. And on the other hand, I, I kept being told that I, you know, I've, like I kept being like scolded for like not doing what I'm supposed to do, not doing my homework and whatever. And it's always like the thought was, oh, she's so intelligent. So she's not doing homework just because she's lazy. Um, and <clears throat> I kind of intuitively knew in my heart that that's not true, but of course I didn't have the words for it. And and <clears throat> there are a lot of other things also that's not exactly directly about education, but I was very like what they call sensitive. <clears throat> Keep, so I was like stimulated very easily. So I was, you know, maybe throw like throwing fits like if if someone would tease me i would like respond very strongly and i i cried a lot and whatever and the grown ups in my life it was continuously um oh don't, like stop being so sensitive don't take it so hard oh just ignore like people don't tell this to your kids Ignore, like, if you ignore them, they will stop teasing you. What they want is, that doesn't work. Parents don't say this to your children. It's like, I, I get literally angry with this. Like when people say, oh, bullies or, or someone teases you. If you ignore them, they go away. That's not true. But what I'm saying is, what kind of thing it is to say to a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, stop being so sensitive don't take it too hard so much you need to give them strategies how to deal with stuff okay and that was never done and i mean nobody had bad intentions it was just not the it, it didn't exist like adhd didn't exist or sensory processing thing so instead of, so me as a child was always, always, my brain was always overwhelmed. My senses were always overwhelmed. 
and I never got any kind of acknowledgement that, you know, it was not like character, like, and, and I never got any strategies how to deal with being so overwhelmed. It wasn't acknowledged of me being like neurologically overwhelmed. It's just stop being so sensitive, whatever. So <clears throat> this, I mean, I, I grew up and it went all the way through high school. Now, in high school, we already did have tests and grades and whatever. And I would come sit in class, listen to the lectures, barely ever did any homework, barely maybe read a little of you know the material. And I would come and I would get like A or worse, B+. Plus. But let's say when we had to write essays, I wouldn't. Um, because I, I never got the study skills. I, I would give up. I wouldn't do it. And they would tell me that, uh, you know, it's bad that they don't do it, but they never gave me the help I needed. Nobody ever even realized it's like, if you are an A student, and you also don't disrupt the class, you are not going to get help. Uh, that's just the, the fact of life. It's, um, and that does have, I think my belief is it definitely has something to do <clears throat> with the gender differences. And it's not that anybody deliberately discriminated against girls. <clears throat> but manifestation of ADHD in girls and boys can be very different. I My brain was so overwhelmed that I was kind of frozen. I, I, de I barely moved, you know. Um, it's just because, like, my brain was so overwhelmed, I didn't have even, I couldn't even move, you know. <clears throat> and... I also, you know, was like a good girl, so I didn't disrupt in class. And on the other hand, boys, when they're bored and frustrated, they usually, they don't sit quietly and suffer internally. They are acting out physically. <clears throat> and as a result, boys get diagnosed more and get more help. Um, but this is really doesn't have to do specifically with the kibbutz. I think it's through uh, everywhere. Um, think, thank you so much for sharing that experience. I think what you're talking about is so important. You grew up in a time and a place where you were not getting the resources <laughs> you needed. So I'm very and, interested to learn how you, what changed for you and how you were able to eventually so, get what you needed. Think, and what, what's hard for people to understand is how mentally damaging it is to be under challenge and bored for so long. I mean, the level of frustration is, is just, it's terrible. And I finished <clears throat> 12 years of school with, uh, uh, you know, A uh, average and zero learning skills. I could not, like, I guess also my school was just easier than, than other schools. Um, I could not, like, read a whole book and summarize it. It also has a lot to do with ADHD. <clears throat> Um, I didn't get the like the writing skills. Um, <coughs> Do you want to pause and get some water? No. We can pause. It's okay. Um, I had zero study skills. And when I was like mid-20s, I attempted to go to college in Israel. And between the ADHD 
and the undi I mean, nothing was diagnosed back then. And the uh, bipolar disorder that I didn't know I had, I, I was signed up to college. I showed up sometimes to some of my classes and only those that were at least after 10 a.m. Um, I like par partied and drank. I also had to work um, because, so basically I finished that one year, the college told me, I mean, you can stay, but you have to repeat the whole first year because you don't have, in, in college I, I failed, but it's mainly I didn't even go to the exams. So, you know, things like that. So, um, <clears throat> and I was, uh, I, I left the kibbutz when I was around 24 years old. Um, and when you left the kibbutz, you had, you had nothing you had no money, you had to work. And now I, I, that's okay, but of course it makes, I mean, uh, my parents would have liked to support me, but they didn't have money. Uh, so when you left the kibbutz, you pretty much had to do everything for yourself and start from literally zero. Anyways, what changed? Why I'm, I'm now, <clears throat> in Montgomery College, a high GPA. Um, I academically am very successful. It's a, it's a fact, so I guess I can say it without it being, you know. Um, <clears throat> well, what changed? First of all, I started going to school when I was 49 years old. Um, I am married. I have a supportive environment and a stable environment. But what changed is that uh, I got that my learning disabilities and my bipolar disorder got diagnosed. So my son also has ADHD and he is on the uh, autistic spectrum. It's very high functioning, but he's definitely on the spectrum. And uh, like many parents of my generation, <clears throat> I realized I have the ADHD when I started filling up those beautiful questionnaires uh, um, for, you know, all those uh, scales and stuff. Uh, and they ask all kind of questions about your child, <laughs> which we did for him when he was about six or seven years old. Um, so how many times a week uh, i forgot actually uh, you know they're all kind of questions um uh, how many times a week you feel i don't know distracted or you forget uh, to do things and blah 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 and i'm like filling it up for him <clears throat> and i'm like you know for like scale of one to five i'm like about him four, 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 and I'm like thinking about myself, five, five, seven, five. Um, <clears throat> and that's really pretty much all the people my age that I know that uh, are diagnosed with ADHD diagnosed themselves through the questionnaires for their children, because surprise, surprise, our children also have ADHD when, and Anyways, I definitely, I realized that I have ADHD when I was around 41 years old, but was busy working, taking care of my son. So only when I was 43 years old, I went to the doctor. Interestingly, uh, children go to neurologists and adults go to psychiatrists to get diagnosed with ADHD. So I went to a psychiatrist to get a diagnosis um, and he uh, wholeheartedly agreed with me, my diagnosis. And I started uh, taking uh, Concerta, long, long release Ritalin basically. And it's 
it's a very significant difference. Of course, it doesn't fix the past. It right. doesn't fix all the frustration. It doesn't fix the lack of study skills. Even more focused, if I, I never learned how to summarize a book, um, it doesn't fix that. Um, now, another thing, though, and a quick, it's unrelated to immigration stuff, but I, I have to say it. <clears throat> Many people don't understand what ADHD is, and I think the name attention deficit disorder is misleading because uh, the main issue with people with ADHD is that um, we have too much attention. <laughs> Basically, the ADHD brain, you pay attention to everything, all details. And while rationally, I know that not all details are important, some are not important at all, and definitely not all of them are as important as others. In the ADHD brain, you, <clears throat> your, my brain doesn't prioritize facts. So when you're compelled to pay attention to all details, you end up not being able to focus. Attention and focus is not the same, okay? <clears throat> and people also have a lot of misconceptions about uh, Ritalin and other things like that. And how I'm saying it is, I describe it without the uh, concerta, <coughs> the, like 100 thoughts, a thousand details, they're all bouncing in my head and they're all yelling as loud as, you know, they're all like asking for the same level of attention from me, which of course is not possible. And same like with the ADHD is like if you're trying to write a paper sitting on the shoulders of I-270 during rush hour and you take the medicine and suddenly you're writing the paper on the beach with only the waves. And the, so kind of that's how it works for me. However, after I started taking that, <clears throat> it, my my doctor when I came for you know follow up for medication management kept asking me questions the screening for um, depression and the reason I'm talking about all of that because that's what allowed me to become a student and to be successful in it. <clears throat> Problem with these diagnostic questions for depression is that they're subjective and main is like, how many days a week uh, do you feel bad now? <laughs> or how many days a month? <clears throat> and if you felt uh, really bad for like 30 or 40 years, you already don't know that this is feeling bad. That's just your regular state, okay? Um, and I would say maybe two or three days a month, because two or three days a month, I was feeling like really bad when like crying and thinking everything is hopeless and whatever, but he kept asking me. So I came to my husband. I'm like, listen, he keeps asking me those questions, but it's so subjective. I told my husband, you tell me. If I asked you about myself, how many days a month I'm in a bad mood? And my husband said over 50%. And he was being very generous because probably over 90 would be a much more accurate description. So I went to the doctor, started taking antidepressants, and it was like, that was like the shocking I would wake up in the morning and if nothing really bad happened I would feel fine and I'm like oh my god that's how other people feel all the time if nothing is wrong they feel fine I didn't even know I'm not feeling fine 
okay? Because I always was not feeling fine. And I didn't, I was in so much physical pain. I didn't even know I was in pain until I started taking the antidepressants and the pain went away. So I'll try to make a long story a little shorter. After a little bit with antidepressants, I got a manic episode. Um, and of course, I didn't know it's a manic episode, but I called my doctor and told him something is wrong. The the um, concerta doesn't work anymore. I can't call focus. And I also I told him I'm too I'm too happy for the circumstances. It could happen that if you're not bipolar, antidepressant would cause a manic episode. But in my case, we went to the doctor, me and my husband, and my husband helped with answering the diagnostic questions. And I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder type two. Um, can Google it if you don't know the difference between type one and type two. <clears throat> I started taking the medicines, and that is what allowed me to start fulfilling my poten potential. Um, uh, I, I was working in jobs that made me miserable and I, I you know of, of course were not intellectually any kind of fulfilling or satisfying but if you don't have a degree you can't get jobs uh, you know so anyways during so I was 43 it was like 2014. Fast forward to 2020 pandemic. I once I was able to fulfill my potential more, I became a, a, a realtor, which I loved. But after we moved to Marsville, that's more remote and whatever. And um, beginning of 2020, I retired from being a realtor, not because of the pandemic, but it was excellent timing. <laughs> And pandemic started, my husband started working from home. My son started having school, like school from home. And I was home kind of doing nothing. And also because of the pandemic, I couldn't go out anymore. I mean, we live in a rural area, so we would go for walks, but I didn't have any human contact other than my family. Um, other than going to grocery stores, which is not a real human contact. So basically, I'm my brain, like, A, I was like the only one in the household who was doing nothing. And also, my brain got already um, really was not good. So I started uh, August of 2020 and signed up for a class in Montgomery College. The reason I'm in Montgomery College, even though I live in Frederick County is that my husband works for Montgomery College. Um, so I took a class online. It was for brain stimulation. I took English 101 because I had to, because that's the first class you have to take if you don't, you know. Um, I wasn't even expecting it, but I enjoyed it tremendously. I'm like, wow. Fall, I took one more class, which shall remain nameless because I didn't enjoy it. Um, and I think Montgomery College has excellent, spectacular faculty, but that fall class was not. Um, but I realized I enjoy studying. I enjoy so basically by 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 fall of 2020 i was like okay i'm going to do an associate degree and like a month later i'm like oh i'm going to do a, a complete a, a undergrad and a few months later it's like and th that's the plan now i'm i'm going to do a masters um <clears throat> what what an incredible journey <laughs> and 
Yeah, that, that would be the focus of my book. Coming in like 10 years to a store near you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Uh, let's, me, hope, let's hope it's uh, six years. Now, could you tell me a little bit about, you mentioned that there were some faculty members that, that helped you a lot, that you had some positive experiences. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit so, about that? At, at first, it's not like directly helping, but they were just fabulous. Um, in winter of 2020, or is it called 2021? Like, yeah. The I know winter, that inter, inter period between, I think it's in January, so it might be. No, winter starts like at the end of December and ends. Okay. The, I took a uh, introduction to, um, it's a long name, introduction to women's studies, stud, sexual studies, sexual, whatever, um, with a professor. This my dog. Come on, Toby. Stop nagging. Come here. Come. <laughs> my dog he wants attention. My baby. Um, Professor uh, Carly Miles. Um, women gender studies, and that was the first class I took. That it's like. mind blown i mean i <clears throat> like it really was something that's like opened new worlds for me both the specific material but also learning how to intellectually and academically study and analyze those materials just a minute toby come here come come he's nagging me to pet him but he doesn't want to go on the sofa so i'm like <laughs> need to lean forward i have a dog um, too i understand when and, they want and to then i took uh two political science classes with professor greg sember i believe um and it, it was excellent. Some other classes, the, the classes themselves might have been a little bit less interesting, but it's it's more, I think, about the topic than, than the professor, like psychology. That's, for me, it was just not, <coughs> the topic doesn't speak to me as much. And well, can you uh, a little uh, bit about how you started writing poetry and your uh, love? Uh, why you decided to become an English major. <laughs> okay. When I started, I thought my, I, I, my declared major was uh, political science. And again, in Montgomery College, it's some gen more general names. General I, don't, I called it political science. Um, as for poetry, so first of all, through the English 101 class, I realized that I enjoy writing um structured essays because I did write a lot of stuff before mainly on Facebook but uh, people write like short posts on Facebook I would write like a you know three pages essay on Facebook um, but I, I realized how much I'm enjoying the fact that I can structure it and make it more cohesive and stuff and I always wanted to also write for publishing so I knew that I need to right you know not like i talk here when it's like going all over the place uh, i need to focus a little more um with the poetry uh, because it seems like it's very important for you that i speak about the poetry well the reason <laughs> i ask is because i i watched the video when you were yes. in her, monica misha's class and i watched you reading those so, poems and I, it's very moving Except uh, since since I was like, you know, uh, last time I wrote poetry before Montgomery College was probably when I was 12. Mm -hmm. And um, Professor Sember mentioned that there was the like the, the Raptor Slam or something. It's like a talent show and their prizes. And I'm like, okay. Um, 
I'll write like telling myself I'll write like, I'll write a poem for the for the show. Maybe I'll maybe I'll win a Roku TV. <laughs> I wrote a poem and then I, I kind of um, was selected to go to the second stage. So I had to write another poem because I only had one. <laughs> so I wrote I love the this other. Story. Huh? I love this story. Yeah. <laughs> so the motivation I, for writing. <laughs> I wrote, so <laughs> I wrote another poem. Um, and enjoyed it but it's not like I'm not like a, a person like I'm walking around and I have to let it out and the poetry is like in my blood and in my bones and I'm <clears throat> excuse me so then professor um I don't want to mispronounce her name Mishi I think it's Monica Mish, but I can check on that. Oh, I think it's... Oh, Monica, forgive me. I spoke with her and I actually interviewed her uh, on you know, whatever. <clears throat> Let's. It's definitely not Mish, but... <laughs> we can Misha? check. Mishi. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying it now. Anyways, she... <clears throat> she produced and edited and published a book through Montgomery College um, that's called You Were Planted Here to Create Something Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I have the book somewhere here. Um, you have been planted here to create something beautiful. Okay, and it is anthology. Can you read the whole uh, title since you have it there? So I'm I'm looking at it on YouTube right now, but I can pull it up. Let's see here. Uh, it's on Barnes and Noble, it's available for sale on uh, Bar uh, Barnes and Noble. Yeah, it's like a, an anthology of it's through poetry, memoir, essays, and visual art. The contributors, all past or current students at Montgomery College, all living with a disability, share their. But there is like in the title, it's like says something like anthology by students with the like Montgomery College students with disabilities whatever um so uh I guess she probably contacted I uh, know I just got emails oh. generally emails oh yeah you want to read it says, you have been planted here to create something beautiful an anthology by writers and artists with disabilities um, by Monica, and I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Mishi maybe, M-I-S-C-H-E, -S the editor. So one, one You'll of, have to forgive us and we'll go with Mishi right now. I always call her Monica, so, <laughs> but she, um, um, but maybe so talk I, about her efforts to put together this work and how that impacted you. Yeah, so, I just, I got the emails from the uh, like uh, DSS, the Disability Support uh, Services about this anthology, like that they sent to everybody. And I'm like, okay, I'll submit my poems. So I submitted my poems and I mean, this anthology, they didn't take every work that was sent to them, but it's not a highly selective one, okay? But still, it was still, I felt really happy that they are going to publish my my poems. And um, I wrote like some kind of a foreword because the poems in some ways are contradictory and they were written only a week or two apart. So, you know what? Can you do me a favor and pause for a moment? Oh, absolutely. 